Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to our sixth edition of the special lectures of the Haki Vienna International Science School. I'm really, really excited uh, to introduce Lisa Sauermann from the University of Bonn. So Lisa is a legend uh, for uh, many different reasons. So she's a terrific mathematician um, and, uh, and has uh, made uh, a great name for herself. Uh, as a researcher, but uh, several years ago, um, uh, until uh, Lisa was uh, already known as a high school student to the world, as at one, uh, uh, I think, for, uh, in um, when you competed in math Olympiads for setting a record of, I believe, four gold medals and a, a bronze medal. See, is yeah. that? Silver, a silver and, and four gold medals. And at one IMO, uh, you really showed everybody else off. You were the only one with full score. Uh, so uh, that's uh, really, uh, I mean, I guess that's the best possible type of accomplishment for a young mathematician. Um, right. But, um, but now it's all about research. And uh, we look forward very much uh, to your talk on the card game set and uh, results on extremal combinatorics. Uh, Lisa, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much to, for organizing this. And um, thank you to all of you from um, all these different places around the world uh, for coming and listening. It's, it's, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, Okay, so today I'm gonna talk about, or at least the talk is gonna start um, uh, with the card game, card game set. So some of you may know this game, um, but for those of you who don't, let me just roughly explain how this game works. So it's a popular card game, you can buy it in the store, it's really for everyone, not just for people who like math. Um, and so this card game, when you buy it in the store, you get such a box, um, and uh, in the box you will find 81 cards. And each of these cards has some symbols on it. So here on this picture, there are some cards lying on a table. And so as you can see, each of these cards has some symbols on it, namely one or two or three symbols. And on each card, the symbols are all the same. So for example, here you have three times the same symbol on this purple card. Okay, but so each card has one or two or three identical symbols on it. And these symbols are characterized by various properties. So each card in total has four properties. The first property we already talked about, namely the number of symbols, which can be one, two, or three. <clears throat> the next um, property is the color of the card. So as you can see on the picture, the card can be red or green, or maybe the purple you don't see so well on the picture, but there's a third color, which at least in this edition of the game is purple. Then um, the third property is the shape of these symbols. So in this edition, the symbols can be either oval like this, or um, a rectangle like this, or wavy like this. I think the exact shapes that come in the box may depend on your country. So since you are all from many different countries, you might have noticed that in your, uh, where you are from, the cards look slightly different. So I think this picture is a French edition from maybe 20 years ago. And that's also how it looked like when I played it as a kid in Germany. But I know that in the US, they have different cards. So in the US, I think they have diamonds, maybe instead of waves or something. But anyway, it doesn't terribly much matter. Um, ah, so actually, um, yeah, actually, I, I wrote here diamond also because uh, that's going to be easier later for drawing. OK, so, so let's not look, focus too much on this picture here. But so let's, um, let's uh, um, assume that there are three different symbols, and we'll call them diamond, oval, or wave. And the actual symbols printed on the cards may depend on the edition of the game that you're buying. Um, okay, and then the fourth property is the filling of the symbols. So the symbols can be empty, like here, or full, like here, or they can be kind of shaded, like here. Okay, so in, so in total, you see that there are these four different properties, and for each property, there are three possibilities, and that also explains um, where, why there are 81 cards in total in the game, because for each of these four um, properties, you have three different possibilities. And so the total number of cards you can form is three times three times three times three. So it's three to the four, which is 81. So that's why there are 81 cards in, this, um, in the game box. Um, okay, and so every possible combination is there once in the box as a card. Okay, any questions so far? So I think I explained now how this game looks like we haven't talked about yet how you play that game. Um, so here's how you play the game. So in the, the goal of the game is to find the so-called set. And what is a set? 
A set consists of three cards with the following properties. So here's an example of three such cards. And these are the properties. So these are the properties that three cards need to satisfy in order to form a set. The first property is that all of the three cards have the exact same number of symbols or the three numbers of symbols and the three cards are all distinct from each other. So in this example here, we have one symbol here, two symbols here, or three symbols here. So that's all different numbers. So that's okay. One, two, three is allowed. Two, two, two would also be allowed. Or one, one, one would be allowed. Or three, three, three would be allowed, but not two, two kind of the same and the third different. That wouldn't be allowed. Okay, so in the next um, the next property is that um, all three cards must have the same color or the three colors on the three cards must be all different. So here they are different, purple, green, and red, that's okay. If they were all three the same, that would also be okay. Um, uh, but you shouldn't have two the same and one different, that wouldn't be okay. Um, and then the same rule again for the shape, I think you're getting the pattern. So for the shape again, the uh, three shapes should be all the same. Um, or all different from each other. So here it's all different, it's one uh, uh, wave, one uh, uh, oval and one diamond. And um, the uh, fourth property is that the filling of the symbols should be the same for all three cards or the fillings should be all distinct for all the three cards. Um, so here again, the fillings are all distinct. It's one empty, one shaded, one full. Okay, so here's another example of a set. Um, uh, where, where the rules are satisfied. So here you see the three numbers are all different, the three colors are all different, and the shapes are all the same, they're all oval, and the fillings are all the same, they're all uh, completely filled. So in other words, to summarize the rules more quickly, a set consists of three cards, so that for each of the properties, so the properties number, color, shape, and filling, the three cards are either all equal or all distinct with respect to that property. So that's a set. So this is an example of a set, and um, what we saw in the last, um, Last uh, slide was also an example of the set. And so now here's how you play the game. Um, so when you play the game, you um, put some cards on the table, not all 81, but some cards you flip over, I mean, flip open and put on the table. And then um, you play this with several players. And the goal is to quickly identify a set among the current cards on the table. And the person who's fastest to find one can take the cards, and then new cards are flipped. And who has the most cards in the end wins? Uh, Lisa, may yes. I stop you briefly? Um, so apparently some of our audience is in a different Zoom meeting. Uh, I will quickly go and fetch them. Um, would you tell the students an anecdote? <laughs> okay, I'll tell the students an anecdote about set in the meantime. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be taking a moment. Okay. Um, okay, so um, here's an anecdote about set. Um, so, um, so you... Um, can you may, uh, may, 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 some of you maybe know the game memory, which has nothing to do with the game set. But the game of net memory, uh, usually, it, it's usually for smaller kids. Um, it usually comes with a deck of um, cards with um, pictures on it, for example, pictures of animals. And then you have each picture twice and you flip everything sort of face down so that you can see, can't see them. And then you select two cards, flip them over. If they're the same, you can take it and it's your turn again. Otherwise, it's the next player's turn. So I think that's a rather simple kids game, which at least in Germany is extremely common. I don't know whether it's also very common in other countries, but some of you may have uh, heard of game. So now you can think about how to combine the two games. So you can try to play set memory. So you put your 81 set cards all on the table um, face down. And now you can flip over three cards, and if they form a set, you can keep them, and otherwise, you, you, it's the next player's turn. So, um, yeah, so here's an anecdote. Um, so, I was once at an IMO, I, I, I was not a uh, student anymore, I was um, grading at the IMO. So, I was once at the IMO grading, and so at evening, in the evening, as you know, in the, at the IMO, people sort of have fun and play games and so on. So, someone had a box of set. And so we played set for a while, but at some point it became boring to keep playing set. So we came up with the idea of playing set memory, the way I just explained with the, you kind of flip everything over and then you can choose three cards. But as you can imagine, this is much harder than the ordinary memory game with the, with the pictures of animals on it, because with these set cards, it's extremely hard to memorize sort of how they look like. It's much easier to think there's a rabbit rather than there is a two green overs full and so on. And it took something like three hours until we were done, but we finished. Um, okay, I don't know whether this anecdote was long enough. Um, yeah, so I don't re recommend combining set and memory. It wasn't that much fun. Um, 
I think. Uh... Lisa, uh, so our audience is spontaneously um, increased uh, by a lot. Uh, may I briefly reintroduce you? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, dear audience, sorry for the mix up with uh, the links. It's um, great to have you. Uh, please send your privits uh, from wherever it is that you uh, are. So, Lisa has a sense of uh, uh, who is with us today. Um, there are participants registered from 39 countries. So, uh, I, I love that very much. Right. Lisa, uh, you are being reintroduced. Um, uh, maybe, uh, would you stop sharing the screen for a moment? Uh, sure. Uh, right. Uh, so Lisa uh, Sauermann is uh, our speaker today in this sixth uh, lecture, special lecture of the Haki Vienna International Science uh, School. Um, so there are participants uh, from all over the world, uh, IMO teams, uh, represented from 39 different countries, um, a very, very mixed, uh, talented crowd. And um, it's very exciting uh, and a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce Lisa Sauermann uh, this time to all of you. Uh, Lisa is uh, what you can truly call an up and coming researcher. She's uh, uh, achieving fantastic results in, uh, in combinatorics. Uh, she's just moved from uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, to uh, the University of Bonn. And um, she's a legend of high school math competitions. So one year at the IMO, she was uh, the only uh, contestant to achieve the perfect score uh, gold medal. Uh, she held a record uh, for achieving four gold medals and one silver medal uh, for uh, several years. Um, and with it, um, uh, she was uh, the most successful participant uh, of the um, uh, IMO uh, for, for uh, all, all times prior uh, to, to her achievement. Yeah, and she's with us today and, um, uh, and she's uh, uh, telling us about the card game set uh, and uh, its combinatorics uh, and other results from extremal combinatorics. Uh, and maybe maybe some questions she 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 finds really fascinating and that are still open uh, and and for you guys to uh, to run your teeth uh, into. So my great pleasure, Lisa, and uh, maybe you can uh, very briefly remind us of the card game set. Uh, some of the students have already been uh, reminded uh, in the first ten minutes of your talk. Well, and there we go. Okay, so. I'll briefly go over the previous slides. So set is a card game with 81 cards, which look roughly like that. And each card has a number of, um, has one, two or three symbols on it. It's red, green or purple. And the symbols on it are diamonds, ovals or waves or, um, and the filling of the symbols is empty, shaded or filled. So each card has identical symbols, which are one or two or three of them, which also have those properties. And so now um, the game of set is about finding, uh, finding sets. Okay. so. Um, uh, here is an example of a set. Um, so a set is three cards and there are rules about when three cards form a set. So this is one example. And so here are the rules. So the first rule is that all the three cards need to have either all the same number of symbols or the three numbers of the of symbols on the three cards need to be distinct. So it's not okay to have twice the same number and the third is different. It has to be either all the same or all different. And then similarly for the other properties. So the cards need to either have all the same color or the three colors need to be all different, all distinct. Uh, so twice the same color and the third different is not okay. And then again, for the shape, I think you're getting the pattern. So the shape uh, shapes have to be either all the same or all distinct. And similarly for the filling, the fillings have to be either all the same or all distinct. So let's just examine this here. So here the three numbers are distinct, that's okay. The three shapes are distinct, that's okay. The three fillings are distinct, that's okay. And the three colors are distinct, that's okay. And here's another example of the set. So here the three numbers are distinct, that's okay. The three colors are distinct, that's okay. The three shapes are all the same, that's also okay. And the three fillings are all full, that's also all the same, that's okay. And so these three cards also form a set. And so now um, I was saying earlier that the uh, goal when you play this game set is so there are certain cards lying on the table 
And your goal is to find a set, as a, so that means three cards with these rules as quickly as possible. And well, that uh, that makes means that you can take the cards and who has the most cards wins. That's sort of less important for the talk, though. How you actually then play this game against your opponent. What's most crucial for us is um, this concept of three cards forming a set. And so when you play the game, usually there are twelve cards on the table, and then all the players try simultaneously to find a set. Um, um but um yeah so but then there's a natural question sorry yeah uh, then there's a natural question is that even always possible when you have 12 parts on the table is it always possible to find a set among these 12 parts and so those of you who have played this game before probably know the answer to the question the answer is no it's not always possible so it's possible to have 12 cards lying on the table without having a set among them and so then all the players will search for a while, but nobody will find that one if there is one. And so then, um, according to the rules of the game, if that happens, more cards will be added to the table when there is no set until someone finds one. Okay, but so then a very natural question arises. What's the maximum possible number of cards that you need in order to guarantee to find a set? So can this continue forever, but um, more cards need to be added? Or what's the maximum number you can reach um, until you are sure to find a set? And so that's the question we want to talk about in this talk. So this question belongs to the area of extremal combinatorics, um, which is the area I, my, my research, um, or, I mean, my research area. Um, and so extremal combinatorics means that you are studying the maximum or minimum possible number of objects under certain constraints. So that sounds rather abstract. But in this example, maybe it becomes more clear. Here you're studying the maximum possible number of cards with the constraint that there's no set. So among these cards, set cards was maximum possible number of cards without having a set. So that's our constraint here. And then we are asking for the maximum possible number. So that's an extremely question because it asks about a maximum under this constraint. And so here's the answer to the question. The answer has actually been known for a long time. I believe that's certainly older than the card game set itself. Um, the maximum possible number of cards without a set is 20. So that was proved by Pellegrino over 50 years ago. Um, okay, so extreme combinatorics is an active research area in mathematics. Um, but usually when you do extreme combinatorics, you are not um, so much, so you're mostly interested in, inter, uh, in studying the behavior of these the types of problems you're asking about when the variables get very large. So you're not necessarily interested in the specific small number 20, but you're interested in the behavior of the problem when the variables um, tend to infinity. And then again, you don't necessarily want to know the answer exactly. So an exact number like 20 is maybe less, interest, uh, less important, but the goal is to understand the growth behavior of the answer. So we don't want to necessarily boil it down exactly, but we want to understand the growth behavior of the answer as the variables tend to infinity. Now in our question, there wasn't a variable, right? We just had a game. So, um, so in uh, if you're an ex uh, person working in extreme combinatorics, um, then um, maybe the most natural thing popping in your head when you study set is not much just this particular game with these eighty-one cards, but you want to sort of consider this um, game more abstractly. You want to sort of um, uh, consider an extended, more general version of the game where each card doesn't have just four properties, but n properties for some larger number n. So n is the number of variables. So just to make that more concrete, right? This sounds rather abstract to generalize this game. So suppose, um, so the same set, the game set has sold a lot of copies. And as you maybe know from movies, whenever something is successful, you want to make a sequel. Um, and um, so maybe you want to sort of, and, and actually even with board games, like uh, probably you, you guys know Settlers of Catan, and um, after that was very successful, a huge number of extensions of it have been published because well, then you can sell even more, you can, uh, yeah. So suppose you wanted to make an extension of the game set. So, and so our extension, in our extension, we want to just have more properties rather than the four properties. So we remember so far we had the four properties, the number, um, the color, the shape, and the filling. But suppose we want to make more properties. So here I, um, my design skills are limited, but here are some ideas I came up with. So you could add another property, namely the background color. 
So for example, in the normal game, the cards all have a white background, but there's no need for that. You can add a property here. The background could be either white, gray, or black. And then maybe at the side of the card, you want to make a frame. So the frame could either be no lines or no frame, like in the standard cards, or a single line or double line. So in this picture, we would have a red card with a double line as a frame. So that would be another property. Or another property you can come up with is the size of the symbols. So they were all sort of the same size, but you could make them small, big, or medium. That would be another property. And I'm sure your create creativity is um, less limited than mine. So I'm sure you could come up with even, so there are 64 people in the Zoom room. I'm sure each of us could come up with yet another idea. And then we would have another 64 more properties. Um, so you can invent a lot more properties for this game. So it's easy to imagine that rather than just having four properties, the cards could have N properties for any number N. You could kind of find many different ide ideas to how to design cards with that type of properties. Okay, so let us from now on imagine that each card is n properties and in the standard set game that's currently sold in the store we have n equals four, but you could imagine selling a version of it with larger n. Um, so again for each property there should be three possibilities, and so that means in our extended game with n properties, the total number of cards is three to the n right because we have n properties and for each there are three possibilities, so that means three to the n total possibilities to form cards. And still, as before, a set, even in this extended game, consists of three cards, so that um, for um, each property, the three cards are either all equal or all distinct with respect to that property. So for example, if you have the symbol size property, the symbols should either all the same size or all different sizes. So one small, one medium, one large. Um, okay, and then again, you can ask the same question and what's the maximum possible number of cards without a set in a set game with n properties. Okay, so we already saw, saw that for n equals four, so that's the standard ga game, the answer is 20, but in general, the answer will depend on this variable n here, right? So the answer will be a function of n. So let s of n be the maximum possible number of cards is in this question. So the maximum number, number of uh, cards um, without a set in a set game with n properties. So that's s of n. So for example, s of four, we saw was 20. And so, as I said before, the goal is not necessarily to calculate this S of N exactly. So it's probably impossible to calculate S of N exactly as a function of N. But the goal is to understand its growth behavior as N tends to infinity. So as N, N is large, we wanna understand the growth behavior of this function S of N. So that means we wanna find good lower and upper bounds for this function, which have the same type of behavior as a function of N. So we want to bound this or estimate this to understand the fourth behavior. Okay, so here's again a reminder S of N is the maximum possible number of cards without a set in a set given N properties. And so, as I said, we want to bound S of N. So here, let's start with an observation. I claim that S of N is always at least two to the N. And so here's a proof for this. So in order to show that S of N is at least two to the N, we need to show that we can always choose two to the n cards without a set. Okay, so here's how we can do that. For each of these n properties, so for example, for the color, let us choose our favorite two of the three possibilities. So, um, so let's ask Michael, which, um, uh, okay, so maybe with color I start. So for, for color, my, uh, my two favorite colors of the uh, colors there are red and green. So let's take these as good colors, red and green. Now for the next property, so for example, for shape, let's ask Michael what are his favorite shapes. Uh, he's muted, so we can't hear him. Uh, let's say diamond and uh, smiley face. Well, smiley face is not a thing on the get set game. Oh, I have to... Uh... Yeah, so you are restricted to three choices out of, out of which you need to choose two. <laughs> Let's see, but what are my options for I shape? think they are diamond, oval, and gray. Okay, uh, I, don't, I don't care much for ovals. Okay, so Michael likes um, uh, diamonds and waves. Okay, so let's say we take red, all colors are red and green, all colors, uh, so we take all, only the cards which are red and green because I didn't like the third color. Then we take all the cards which are diamonds and waves because Michael didn't like the ovals. 
And then we ask Dimitri for the next property, say for the filling and so on. So, so for each property, we only allow two of the three options because the third option we don't like. And so that, that way we get two to the n cards. So for each of the n properties, we arbitrarily choose two out of the three possibilities. And then we only have two to the n cards left, which have uh, the chosen poss possibility, one of the two chosen possibilities for each property. Um, okay, so that means um, we, we have two to the n cards. And so now I claim that these two to the n cards do not have a set. So that, here's the reason. So oh, sorry, these two to the n cards don't have a set because if we had a set among these cards, we would find three cards there which form a set. But these three cards could not be all distinct with respect to any of the properties, right? Because for each property, we restricted ourselves to two out of the three choices. So there cannot be any property where all three choices are present in these two to the n cards we chose. And so that means if we have among these two to the n cards, three cards forming a set, then that set cannot be just the three cards in the set cannot be distinct with respect to any of the properties. But so now by the rules for a set, that means they must be the same with respect to every property, right? Because two to the same and the third different isn't allowed for a set. So since all three different, all three distinct wasn't possible either, that means the three cards of the set need to be the exact same with respect to every property. But that's a contradiction because that would mean it would be three times the same card. Okay, and so each card is there only once. So that means among these two to the n cards, we indeed cannot form a set. So that means that S of n, the snark sum number here is indeed at least two to the n. Okay, um, yeah, uh, any questions? Okay, so hopefully I convinced you that S of n, this function is at least two to the n. Um, so here's again this observation. And the best known lower bound for S of n is um, actually a little bit better than this. So that's a rather recent result from less than a year ago of Brett Turrell. So he showed that if n is sufficiently large, then S of n is at least 2.218 to the n. So that's in some sense a similar function as two to the n, just this, um, just this number in the base here is a bit better than two. So 2.218 to the n is a bit better than two to the n. This bound is uh, only if n is sufficiently large. Um, yeah, so Turrell is proof uh, for this bound. So we saw the proof of the two to the n bound on the last slide. It was relatively simple. It was fitting on one slide. Therese's proof for this 2.218 to the n is, I think, um, about uh, 13 pages long or so. I, I, I forgot exactly, but it's certainly many pages. I mean, it's over 10 pages, certainly. And it's based on a configuration for n equals um, uh, 56,232. So that's a large N, that's that many properties with around 10 to the 19,000 cards. So that's, I think, much, much more than the number of atoms in the universe. Um, but uh, Terrell uh, found this um, configuration of roughly that many cards in uh, with uh, this number of properties and then using a so-called product construction from this particular configuration for n equals 56,232, one can get this lower, one can derive this lower bound for all sufficiently large n. But Lisa, we have it on very good authority, uh, namely from Martin Heider, that numbers that large do not even exist. <laughs> well, okay, so that's maybe a question for philosophy. Um, but, um, Okay. But it's just shut our eyes to reality and relish in this result. <laughs> um, but um, let me point out that this restriction that n is sufficiently large um, in, um, is indeed needed here. So if you think back for n equals 4, we already knew that s of 4 is 20, but 2.218 to the uh, 4 is actually roughly 24. So 20 is not at least 24. So this inequality is indeed only true if n is reasonably large. Uh, and not, for example, for n equals four. So for n equals four, this inequality would be false, but that's not a problem because uh, Terrell only claimed or proved this theorem if n is sufficiently large. Um, and so let me also make a historic remark here. So Terrell's very recent result was 2.218 to the n, um, improved uh, bound of 2.217 to the n, which was roughly 20 years older. So if Adele in 2004 proved the bound of 2.217 to the n for sufficiently large n, and so then Terrell um, made this improvement here in the third digit. And um, so you can see that uh, people have studied this question for quite a long time, actually much longer than only 2004. I guess we saw, saw the 1970 result um, a few slides ago. 
Okay, so um, so here's again this definition of S of n, here's this bound we just saw, but how about upper bounds for S of n? So for an upper bound, so for this lower bound, we had to show that we can find many cards without a set. For an upper bound, we have to show that every configuration of a certain number of cards um, ha has a set, or in other words, that every configuration of cards without a set has at most a certain size. So we need to show that if we have a configuration uh, without a set, then there can't be too many cards in that configuration. Okay, so let's try to show such upper bound. So here is a tri uh, rather trivial upper bound, namely S of n is at most three to the n. Okay, so that's trivial because that bound follows simply from the fact that there are at most three to the n cards in total, and that there are only three to the n cards in total in a set game with n properties. So if there are only three to the n cards in total, then uh, obviously the maximum possible number of cards without a set is at most three to the n, the total number of cards. So here's a somewhat better bound. Here's a um, better bound than just this trivial bound three to the n. So f s of n is at most a half times three to the n plus one. And so for this bound, I also want to at least give a proof sketch. So I won't give the proof in all details, but let me sketch the idea of this proof. So to prove this upper bound, um, we need to show that if we have a configuration of cards without a set, then can be at most that many cards, so roughly a half times three to the n. So here's how we do this. So let M be such a configuration, um, so a non-empty set of cards without a set. And so we need to show that this size of this collection of cards is at most this. And so here's how uh, we do this. Let X be an arbitrary card from N. So for example, in this picture, let's assume this card is X. So this picture is for N equals two. There are only two properties in my picture because I couldn't make a picture of 81 cards, but the same proof works for uh, n equals four or any arbitrary n. Okay, so here, this is my card x. And so then um, let's pair up the remaining cards in the set game. So x was some fixed card from our set m. And now all the other cards in the whole game, so all the other three to the n minus one cards, we pair up into pairs so that each pair forms a set together with the card x. So you have to think a little why that's possible. And uh, for time reason, I won't go through the details, but you can check that this is indeed possible. So for so this card X is fixed. And now for every other card, you think about what, what is the third card needed. So for example, for this other card, you think about what's the third card needed to complete X and this card to a set. And then you put that next to this card. And then similarly for that, you put that next to this card. And it's not sort of a priori clear that you can indeed now divide this three to the N minus one cards nicely into pairs like that, but you can check that that's indeed possible. So you have X and now you have all these pairs which together with X forms a set. So that's a set, that's a set, that's a set, that's a set, and so on. Okay, and so now I claim that the set M can contain at most one card from each of these pairs. And that's actually pretty easy to see because X we chose to be a card in M. And now if the set M had two cards from the same pair, so for example, this card and this card here from the second pair, both of them, then together with X, that would form a set inside M, right? Because X was an M. And so if those cards both were an M, we would get a set in M. But that's not allowed because we said M was a set of cards without a set. Okay, so that's not possible. So that means that set M has at most one card from each of those pairs. And because there's that many pairs, a half times three to the N minus one, that means besides the card X, M has at most that many other cards. So the total number of cards in M would be one. That's for the card X plus the number of cards, one from each pair at most. So one plus a half times three to the N minus one, and that's a half times three to the N plus one. Okay, so that shows that the um, size of any collection of cards M without a set can be at most this, so we show this upper bound on S of N. Okay, so here's again the lower bound, here's the upper bound we just showed, and so as you can see, there's quite a difference between this upper and lower bound. Now, our observation is not the best uh, poss uh, possible upper bound, So, but maybe to elaborate this more, let me mention that this upper bound is by a factor of roughly two smaller than the total number of cards three to the N. Um, here's a much better bound. So Meshulam showed in 1995 that the number of S of N is at most two times three to the N divided by N. So here, this upper bound is roughly 50% of all cards. That's roughly 50% of the total number of cards three to the N. This number here is roughly 0% of three to the N, at least if N is large. 
that's a one over n fraction of three to the n. Um, so that means for this, for large n, um, this number is sort of, I mean, vanishingly small compared to three to the n in the sense that the fraction of car, I mean, the fraction of this number divided by three to the n goes to zero. Or in other words, maybe to formulate this maybe a bit more uh, clearly, um, if we have such a collection of cards without a set, then it can only take up a vanishingly small fraction of the total number of cards three to the n. So the fraction, um, so if you have a collection of cards without a set, the fraction of total cards, uh, the fraction of the total number of cards that this collection can take tends to zero as n grows. So that was, um, that follows from this bound of Meshula. Okay, so um, as I said, we're interested in the growth behavior of this function S of n for large n compared to um, three to the n. So in some sense, the last result was already pretty good because it told us that S of n is a vanishingly small fraction of three to the n, but we can try even harder because, so this lower bound um, is sort of 2.218 to the n. So that's sort of exponent, as an exponentially small fraction of three to the n, whereas this is only a polynomially small fraction of three to the n. So maybe let me uh, first mention that this bound of Mishulam was improved by Bateman and Katz um, roughly a little bit less than 20 years later. So they proved that S of n is at most some um, absolute constant C times three to the n divided by n to the one plus epsilon where epsilon is a very small positive constant. So you can think of epsilon as 0 0.01 or something like that. And C is some constant factor, which we don't care super much about because that's a sort of less relevant in this type of bound. But basically this bound of Peyton and Katz shows that um, which improves a little bit the bond of Meshulam because the exponent of n here is now n is now one plus epsilon. So it's a tiny bit bigger than one. Whereas here the exponent is sort of can imagine a one here. So this improves a little bit that bound. And by the way, even though the improvement seems so small, just a small improvement in the in the exponent here, this went to one of the very, very top math journals. So so in for research math, there are journals where these papers get published. And this one to one of the very best journals in all of math. So this was seen a kind of big, big breakthrough, even though the exponent was only improved this tiny, uh, by this tiny epsilon here. But again, so these upper bounds, both here and here, are three to the n divided by some function which grows polynomially with n, whereas this 2.218 to the n is three to the n divided by some thing exponential in n. And so, uh, yeah, so as you probably um, heard about, maybe the latest, uh, maybe uh, certainly in the context of the pandemic, everyone was talking about exponential growth. So as you sort of um, all know, exponential functions grow much faster than these sort of polynomial functions like n or n to the something. So that means um, that this is still way, way, way smaller than this. So because this is three to the n divided by something exponential n, whereas this is only three to the n divided by something polynomial in n. And so it's now a very natural question to ask what's the right behavior? Is it the exponential or the polynomial? Uh, so in other words, you can ask this question maybe more exactly by saying, by asking, is there some constant c strictly less than three so that we have an upper bound that s of n is at most c to the n um, for all n? Um, so the strictly less than three is here because the S of N is clearly at most three to the N. That was the trivial upper bound because the total number of parts is three to the N. But the question is, can we form a bound which is exponentially better? So can we form a bound of the form C to the N for some constant C strictly less than three? So can you put a number strictly less than three and have a bound S of N is that number to the N? And so this question was open for more than 20 years and many researchers have worked on it um, until um, roughly uh, five or six years ago, uh, I guess six or seven years ago, there was a big breakthrough on this question by um, Jordan Ellenberg and Diane Heisweit, um, who showed that S of N is at most 2.756 to the N. So that means that the answer to this question up here is yes. Um, and you can put this constant to be 2.756. So the answer is yes, and you can take, for example, C to be 2.756. Um, and so this paper of Ellenberg and Heisweit, as you can maybe now imagine, was a, it's a much, much bigger improvement than this Bateman and Katz paper I mentioned on the last slide. So this also went to one of the very, very, very best math journals. So this one went to Annals of Math, which um, some people would probably say, or most people would probably say, it's a very top math journal. 
Okay, so this proof of John Ellenberg and Diane Hoyswhite, just for some historical marks, relied on a new polynomial method, which was introduced by um, Kutlev and Pach just a few weeks earlier. So Kutlev and Pach introduced this new polynomial method um, for a similar problem in a slightly different setting. And then Ellenberg and Hoyswhite um, noticed that one can also apply this in this setting and get this breakthrough bound. And since then, this new polynomial method has also been applied to several other problems. Okay, so here are again the bounds. So, um, so this trivial lower bound is that S of n is at least 2.218 to the n if uh, n is sufficiently large. And this n by right upper bound is that S of n is at most 2.756 to the n. Um, and so there's still a bit of a gap between this lower and upper bound, as you can see. So it's still an open problem to close this gap, but at least the behavior of the bounds is the same. So in both, both cases, it's some constant strictly less than three, which is ticked to the nth power. So now it's just um, a question of what's the right number here. Is it 2.218? Is it 2.756? Well, these are both rounded, so that's both not exactly the right number, definitely. But so, yeah, so the question is what's the correct number and is there even one and maybe a limit there? It's not necessarily clear they actually, well, I guess maybe it is clear. So, um, yeah, so so the question is just what what is the right number um, sort of for large n here? But so it's now um, a game of just determining the right number. The correct behavior has already been determined because these two bounds have the same type of behavior. Okay, but now maybe a natural question that many of you might be pondering after I've been talking about this for half an hour is why do so many researchers study this problem about the maximum possible number of cards without a set in an imaginary set game with n properties that you can't even buy in the store? So why would so many people care about that? And why would this research go to top math journals? Um, so that's a very natural question. And the answer is actually, these all these papers do not think about configurations of cards without a set. Um, and uh, as I said, this Pellegrino result uh, from 1970 probably actually even predates the game of set. Um, so actually all of these results are phrased in terms of collections of vectors without solutions to certain equations. So, one, so basically there's an equivalence of this problem of set with n properties that we kind of made up here to a uh, sort of very important additive and extremely combinatorics problem that existed and uh, uh, has been studied for a while. And so, yeah, so in fact, our card problem is equivalent to a famous problem in extremely combinatorics called the cap set problem. And so after talking for set for quite a while, I now wanna tell you um, what this cap set problem, so it's equivalent to the set game problem we made up here, but this original cap set problem, how, how that was phrased originally. Uh, Lisa, yeah. uh, do you think um, it, uh, we could take maybe five minutes for uh, questions? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great, yeah, that's a great moment for taking a break. So a uh, five-minute break uh, from the lecture, uh, um, um, uh, and Lisa is taking questions. Uh, David, will you, would you like to ask your question yourself? Mm -hmm. Well. Could you explain why don't we change the number of possibilities, but only the number of properties? Yeah, that's a great question. So you can also change the number of possibilities and then you get a different problem, which you can also study. The reason I didn't do that in this talk is because, um, well, I wanted to talk about something equivalent to this, um, to this famous cap set problem. And I tell you in the second half of the talk, um, I'll tell you in the second half of the talk what the, um, so this original cap set problem was, and you see why they're equivalent, but asking sort of for the game of set with more properties, that's also a very natural question, which you can study. Um, I think there's less literature about it because it's not as fame, I mean, not really a famous problem like the cap set problem. That was the reason there was so much literature about it, but um, that's a very reasonable question you can ask and study. Um, and yeah, maybe you'll find some interesting grounds. Uh, Ashia has another question. Ashia, will you ask it yourself? I'm just asking whether, like, what's the, if you could talk about the complexity of cap, I mean, of set or cap set, like, is it empty, complete, or, yeah. Um, so what do you mean? Um, so do you mean uh, determine, determining the largest number, like S of N? Yeah. The, the, or the are you asked about giving, the, given a certain configuration, finding a set? 
No, determining S of N given um, number of possibilities and number of, yeah. So you are asking given N determining S of N. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I don't really, to be honest, I don't really know. Um, because so usually in extreme combinatorics, you don't necessarily care about calculating S of N exactly. So um, I, I've never wondered about the question, how hard would it be to actually count it out or find it out exactly? Like, I, I don't, I mean, if you ask in practice, I have no clue how you would actually, um, so that if you wanted to, I mean, okay, so for this, this proof for 20 for n equals four is I think rather non-trivial um, to prove that there's not more than 20 possible and it uses some smart argument. Now, if you have some larger n, if you, um, you don't want to come up with smart arguments, then if you wanted to sort of determine S of N exactly, I guess maybe you could sort of run a computer search on our configurations. I don't know how you would set this up in the best way. And I don't know whether that would in the end be what the complexity of that would be in the end. Um, but yeah, so as I said, um, yeah, so in, in extremely combinatorics, typically you don't wanna, you don't even care about finding the number exactly. You wanna find the growth behavior as N grows. So just something like, a complexity result of the form, well, it would be very complex to calculate this exactly, which maybe would be satisfactory from a computer science perspective, would not really tell me how the function grows. So I want to know how the function grows, and I don't care about whether it's one more or one less, when I understand the rough growth behavior, even if it's complex to calculate exactly. Does that make sense? But yeah, I think it's still a reasonable question what the complexity is about calculating ex exactly. It's just not the perspective that the extreme combinatorial side takes. Um, I don't know whether someone from the complexity side has looked at that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question from Matisa. Hello. So, so if we consider the, the n-dimensional cube with three vertices on each side, uh, and we take it modulo three, I think this problem reduces to collinearity of Yeah, three. so I think you're spoiling the next part of the talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah, I just <laughs> wonder if it's the capset problem or not. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that, that's what it says down here, but it is, yeah, so. So, but, but okay. yeah, we get to that. And if I don't answer what you wanted to ask exactly, maybe ask a bit later again, that's okay. Um. Okay. Um. So Lisa, uh, please proceed. <laughs> oh no, hold on, there's another question from David. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I know, the Ramsey numbers are also from this area of combinatorics and uh, their bounds can be got uh, by the uh, probabilistic method. Uh, can we use it here? I yeah. mean, the probabilistic method. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the um, for this upper bound of Enberg and Price-White does not use probabilistic methods, but some of the results we see later do use probabilistic methods. So, mm -hmm. so it's a great question. Um, so maybe just to, to phrase the question that is maybe more clear to everyone, the question was, um, so um, there's also a um, sort of problem, another problem in extreme combinatorics um, about so-called Ramsey numbers and for Ramsey numbers, probabilistic methods are useful. And so the, uh, so the question that was just asked was, are probabilistic methods also useful for this problem? And the answer to so probabilistic methods means methods of the probability where you do sort of randomness. And so for this bound of Enberg and Price, right, there was no randomness in, in this uh, proof, but um, in the area it's often useful and data we see results um, for somewhat related problems where randomness is useful in the proofs. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Pray continue. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so as uh, one of the questions already sort of forecasted, um, so to see this equivalence, um, let us encode our problem um, or our card problem. So uh, let us encode our cards by codes of length n, where each um, entry of the code is zero, one, or two. So that means we consider um, this, uh, the sequences of length n where the entries are zero, one, or two. And so the collection of all such sequences is denoted by zero, one, two to the n. Okay, and so that means 
um, for to do this encoding for each of the n properties, let us label the three possibilities by zero, one, and two. So, for example, for the property color, we can say that red corresponds to uh, zero, green corresponds to one, and purple corresponds to two. And then, similarly, for the other um, uh, uh, properties, so for example, for the filling, we could say empty is zero, shaded is one, and full is two, and so on. So, for each property, we um, make up some sort of translation table to um, uh, make a correspondence between the options for that property and the number zero, one, and two. And so that way, then for each card, we can, uh, uh, um, we can encode, and then also let's order the properties. So there's the first property, the second property, and so on. And so then for each prop, um, card, we can encode its, proper, its properties by such a sequence in zero, one, two, to the n, by, for example, first taking the um, the value of the card with respect to the first property, for example, the color, then the value of the card with respect to this, the second property, and so on. So we get the sequence encoding the card. And so then we should also talk about adding and subtracting to such sequences. And so as was already mentioned in the question before, um, we can add or subtract these sequences by considering remainder upon division by three. So that's called calculating module three. Um, so uh, many of you may have seen that concept before. And so, for example, here are some examples. So, if you want to add 1102 and 1212 modulo 3, what you get is 2211. So, notice that the last digit here is 1 because 2 plus 2 um, is normally 4, but uh, if you just take remainders by division by 3, so modulo 3, that gives 1. And similarly, 1102 minus, so minus 1212 is 0220. So, here, for example, you see that 1 minus 2 gives 2. Okay, so I think many of you have seen this calculation module of 3D4. So let's, um, um, and for those of you who haven't, it's literally just taking remainders upon division by three. Okay, so um, so we now encoded our parts by sequences in 0, 1, 2 to the n, and we said that we can add or subtract such sequences by calculating module 3. And so there's actually a mathematical notation for doing that. So if you consider 0, 1, 2 to the n with this type of addition and subtraction, um, the mathematical object you get is called F3 to the N. So F3 here is a so-called field consisting of the three elements, zero, one, and two, and N is the sort of N power. So that's a so-called vector space over this field. But anyway, so, so maybe for now, let's call these, uh, N, these sequences vectors, um, but um, let's not worry too much about uh, what this F3 to the N means. And I, I won't use this notation because it might be confusing if you haven't seen it before. But I just wanted to mention that this uh, this type of object is actually a sort of well a well established mathematical object. Okay, so for three cards forming a set, now the corresponding sequences I write vectors rather than sequences because that's a bit shorter and maybe a bit um, bit uh, more clear what it means. But so these corresponding vectors x, y, z, and zero, one, two to the n for three cards satisfying a set, the corresponding vector here satisfy x plus y plus z equals zero, zero, one, so on zero modulo three. So why is that? Well, in each coordinate, so for each property, the three cards are either all equal or all distinct. So that means in each coordinate, the entries of x, y, z are either all three equal or all distinct. Now we can just check that if we take three equal ones, so zero plus zero plus zero is zero, or one plus one plus one is zero, because you calculate upon division by three. So one plus one plus one normally would be three, but if you take modulo three, it's zero. Or two plus two plus two, that's normally six, but modulo three, that's again zero. And zero plus one plus two, so if you take all three distinct, you also get um, zero modulo three. So you can see if you take the entries to be all distinct or all equal, then indeed x plus y plus z is zero in each coordinate. So in total, x plus y plus z is the zero vector, right? so zero, zero, and so on. And conversely, if you have three distinct vectors x, y, z, satisfying x plus y plus z equals zero, zero, and so on modulo three, then the corresponding cards also form a set. So you can check this, that you can make this argument sort of reverse. And so you can see that the configuration of cards, so that three cards form a set, if and only if you have this equation modulo three. And so that means that the configuration of cards without a set corresponds precisely to a collection of vectors in zero, one, two to the n, not containing three distinct vectors x, y, z, with x plus y plus z equals zero, zero, and so on. And so such a collection of vectors is called a card set. So a collection of vectors in zero, one, two to the n 
without three vectors x, y, z, with x plus y plus z is the zero vector module with three is called a cap set. So here's again the definition of this. So a cap set is precisely this. It's a collection of vectors in zero, one, two to the n without three distinct vectors x, y, z with x plus y plus z with zero, zero, zero. And so um, under, uh, under our encoding, as we just said, such a configuration of cards without a set corresponds precisely to such a cap set. And so um, as also was um, maybe part of the question that was asked in the break before, so this condition for the cap set also as geometric interpretation. So um, this condition uh, sort of corresponds to not having three points on a line if you, uh, um, uh, if you define line the right way. So if you take a line in the sort of vector space sense over this field F3, so I assume most of you don't know what that means, but there is a, there's a very established mathematical meaning of a vector space over a field, and then there's a math very established meaning of line, what line means in that vector space. And so if you take that concept that precisely corresponds to that type of um, configuration here, three vectors with x plus y plus z equals the zero vector. So that also, by the way, uses that the characteristic is three here. But so let's not go get into that because it's sort of less relevant for us now, but that ties back to the question that the natural reason to study this, or one natural reason to study this is a sort of a natural version of asking for how many points can you have in a three to the end without three points on a line. Okay, but uh, so back to what we were doing here. So we, we, we were using this definition of cap set because it's a bit easier to formulate. And so cap sets have been studied intensively and were the actual topic of all the previously mentioned mathematical results by Pellegrino, Edel, Turel, Meshulam, Bateman, Katz, and by Kreisweit. So they were all studying not the card game set, but they were studying cap sets. And so as we said, this was under this encoding equivalent. And so the actual phrasing of this result of Enberg and Kreisweit is that the maximum possible size of a cap set in 0, 1, 2 to the n is at most 2.756 to the n. But then, as we said, we can equivalently reformulate it as the maximum possible number of cards without a set in the set game and properties is at most 2.756 to the n. But that cap set problem was the actual problem and with entire spine, and also these other people were studying. Okay, so here's again the definition of a cap set. And so now, um, yeah, so now again, we can ask about what happens if we modify the definition some more? And that ties back to the question that um, I think David was asking before, namely what happens if we don't just allow three entries, so we don't just allow zero, one, and two, but we allow um, other entries for our sequences. So for some given number P, let us now again modify the, modify the question and let's look at vertices in zero, one, and so on to P minus one to the N. So sorry, uh, vectors in zero, one, and so on to p minus one to the n. So in other uh, words, vectors of length n, where every vector, where every entry is zero, one, two, and so on, or p minus one. So maybe one question is why would I stop at p minus one? Where because then there are p to the uh, there are exactly p options. So there are p to the n total vectors. So that's sort of um, nice, and also there are some other reasons we see later. But so, yeah, so just to, here we had three options. So let's instead take P options. And so let's call this option zero, one, and so on to P minus one. And so then when we add the vectors, we now need to calculate modulo P. So taking remainders upon division by P rather than by three. And also we need to modify the condition a little bit. So, so here there's now various ways how you can do a multiplication, but in order to get a sensible problem, the following makes the most sense. So if you want to sort of start from this problem, modify it in this way, then rather than looking at three vectors of x plus y plus z is the zero vectors, we should now look at p vectors x1 and so on to xp with this equation. So x1 plus and so on plus xp is the zero vector. So we don't want to look for configurations of three cards anymore. We want to now look for configurations of p cards with this um, equation. So again, this, this is not sort of set in stone and you can look at various modifications of this. And the question that was asked earlier about what happens if you take the set definition, but now take more, more properties and then you look for, for cards which are all distinct or all equal, you arrive at a different problem than this. So I just wanna make clear, this is not sort of equivalent to the question that was asked earlier about increasing the number of um, options for each property and set, but it's still a, 
a very natural modification of the problem up here. And so this is the, the route of the talk is taking us. So now let's look at this problem. So we want to sort of generalize this capsule problem, um, which was sort of modulo three into a problem modulo P, where we look at vectors in zero, one, and so on to P minus one, three N. Okay, and so now we are looking for um, for configurations of P vectors whose sum is the zero factor modulo P. So then we arrive at the following natural problem, which is sort of a generalization of the cap set problem. So given P, what is the maximum possible size of a collection of vectors in zero, one, and so on to P minus one to the N, which doesn't have P distinct vectors, with the sum being the zero vector modulo P. And so for P equals three, that's exactly asking about the maximum size of a cap set, which is this famous cap set problem. But here for general P, it's a more general problem. And so this more general problem is still largely open, um, as, as, at least if n is large with respect to p. So if n is large with respect to p, then this problem has not is not well understood. And in this in this uh, in this situation where n is large, one can essentially reduce this problem to the case where p is a prime number. That's uh, the reason I called it p in the first place. Um, so you can essentially reduce this to the case where p is a prime. So that means a number which has no divisors besides one and itself. And so for P equals two, so we now restrict ourselves to P being a prime and N being large. For P being the prime two, um, the problem is actually very easy and the answer is two to the N. For P equals three, we've already seen that the problem is exactly the cap set problem. So it's asking about the maximum possible size of cap set. And as we saw before, the best known upper bound for this problem is 2.756 to the N due to N very high size. Um, but for larger primes P, the problem is not, uh, not, not uh, so much understood, but the best known upper bound is roughly as follows. So this is roughly the best known upper bound and it's due to myself and um, Dimitri Zakharov, um, um, who's um, a student at MIT. And so um, what we proved is that the maximum possible size of, in, uh, of a uh, set of uh, vectors in this problem here is at most CP, times d times p to the 0 0.01 to the n. So here cp is some num some constant only depending on p. So we should think here of n is very large and p given. So cp is something depending on this sort of fixed or given p. So it's a constant factor depending on p, but if n is large, then this is just the constant factor. And d is an absolute constant. So d is just some number, we don't know which one, but some given number doesn't depend on p. And so then the main behavior of this term, so the CP is just a constant factor, and the main behavior of this term is like P to the 0 0.01 up to this sort of constant factor here, and then this to the n. So it's again some nth power, but the base of this nth power is sort of um, growing slowly with P. So it's P to the 0 0.01. So that's sort of similar to here. You have some nth power and the base here was 2.756 and was this big breakthrough to find this base strictly less than three. And here our base is some small function of P, namely P to the 0 0.01. And actually I lied a little bit. So yes, again, I restate, um, this was already stated. So the largest collection of vectors in zero one and so on to P minus one to the N, not containing P distinct vectors with this equation. And um, then you have the um, upper bound of this, um, this is an upper bound for the size of this collection. And so I lied a little bit. So our result is actually more general. It's for any fixed positive number instead of 0 0.01. So if you think P to the 0 0.01 is still pretty large, and you would rather have a smaller exponent here than 0 0.01, say you want 0 0.0000001, you can have the same result. Just the CP and the D will be different then. But just for not having even more variables and stating it more clearly, I say that it was 0 0.01 here, but you can get the same result for any, any small positive number here. Okay, um, but it's an open problem whether the upper bound can be improved to something of the form CP times D to the N. So that the lower bound for this problem has this form. So the question is, can you put an absolute constant in the base here? So that you have this exponent, exponent of N and under this exponent here is a function depending on P. It goes slowly with P, but it goes with P. And the big open question is, can you put here a number which does not depend on P? So can you put here such some absolute constant number? And so, um, so that's still a big old question, which I think is very interesting. Um, but let me at the, just at the end also mention that our result here um, also has a geometric consequence. And that's maybe the reason why we wanted to modify the problem this way rather than another way, because this 
a problem has a natural connection to discrete geometry, to some old problem in discrete geometry. Namely, from this result, the following follows. You can choose an absolute constant D, okay, like this, as well as constant C P prime for every prime P. So that the following holds for every prime P and every N, okay. So that's also the preamble. The actual result is that you get this type of bound um, for the following problem among any that many given points in the n-dimensional grid C to the n. So you take some n-dimensional integer grid. So think of the uh, plane grid Z squared, so just the sort of chessboard type grid, but now take it n-dimensional. If you have some n-dimensional grid like that and you have that many points, you can always choose P points whose centroid is again a grid point in C to the n. Okay, so here's again the same statement. And so it's an open problem, an old classical discrete geometry problem called the erdogan fosif problem to determine the smallest number of points needed to make this possible. And so our result here gives a bound for this classical geometry problem. And so just because n dimension is a bit hard to imagine, let me just uh, quickly at the end try to illustrate this type of discrete geometry problem with a concrete picture for n equals two and p equals three. So n equals two because two dimensions fit best on my slide and p equals three because um, well, there's not so much space, so I need a small picture. So let's consider just to maybe forget about this type of bound. The, the message is here that our result gave a bound for this problem, but now let me just try to describe this discrete geometry problem. So you have two given numbers, n less the dimension in this picture two and some number p for us, it's three in this picture. And so you now wanna find you have some given points and you want to find P points. So in our case, that's three points whose center is again a grid point. So suppose you have these four given points here on the, on the left side, um, then you can find three points, then you these three red points whose centroid, so centroid means average, is again a grid point. Then this point, uh, or this cross here indicates where the centroid is, and that's again exactly a grid point. Again, when one of these lattice grid points. So among these four points in the squared, it was possible to find three points whose centroid is again a lattice point. But you think, if you think about this longer, you'll see that not among any four points is possible to find three points whose centroid is a lattice point. So for example, here you find four points, that it's not possible to select three points whose centroid is a grid point. And if you think about this longer, you can find that even among eight points, it's not always possible. So here you have eight points and it's not possible to select three whose centroid is a lattice point. Um, so for n equals three and p equals three, uh, so n equals two and p equals three, the answer is that you need nine points in order to be sure that you can always select three whose centroid is again a lattice point. But so this picture was just to illustrate the problem. You can ask this for any n, uh, n and any p, and then it's an open problem to sort of uh, find this out. And so for um, given p and large n with respect to p, our result here gives the best known current bound for this problem. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. And so thanks a lot for listening. Um, and here are some image credits. Hey, thank you, uh, Lisa. This was amazing. <laughs> and congratulations also on your breakthrough results. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's beautiful. <laughs> uh, let's turn to some questions from the audience. Don't be shy, students. Uh, Paul. Oh, sorry, I was just clapping my hands. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? So, Lisa, uh, maybe uh, um, how did you, for how long have you been wondering about uh, the KZ problem? Um, is this something, uh, is there a continuous development from when you did combinatorics problems in high school uh, to uh, doing research on these, uh, these questions where no one uh, yet knows the answer to now? Or is this a continuous line of development or have you tried many other things that you, uh, that you didn't enjoy so much and then you, you, uh, you found this problem and got really excited about it? Yeah, so so during my undergrad, so I guess I, I uh, when I was in high school, I did IMO as um, as as you already mentioned when introducing me, and so then after high, at some point high school is over, and then I guess um, you go to university. So I did an undergrad in math, and during my undergrad studies, I actually didn't do uh, any combinatorics at all. 
Um, so that was due to a variety of factors. There were so many, so I did my undergrad at Bonn, and there were um, so many amazing courses, and the combinatorics courses were a bit further away and didn't quite fit my schedule. And I was always wanted to take one, but then it wasn't offered at the right time. And anyway, so due to a connection of coincidences, I didn't actually end up taking any combinatorics my, during my undergrad. And I explored a lot of other areas of math, which I also enjoyed. Um, and then I, after my uh, undergrad, so in Germany, a uh, bachelor's degree is three years. So after three years for my bachelor's degree, I went to the US, to Stanford University for the PhD program there. So they have a um, system which is a bit different from the European system in the sense that masters and PhD is typically combined into one program. So it was a five-year program combining masters and PhD. And so when I started that program, I thought I wanted to do algebraic geometry, which was sort of, uh, which is another area of math, which I enjoyed in undergrad. Um, but then um, while I was there, um, a new professor got hired at Stanford uh, doing combinatorics. So his name is Jacob Fox. And so then I took a combinatorics class with him and, and a class on extremely combinatorics. And then I loved it so much that I decided to uh, change my mind and switch to combinatorics. But so in that sense, it wasn't a continuous development sort of from high school math. But so then after I started um, working with uh, this professor, Jacob Fox, one of the first papers he gave me to read was actually this work by Enberg and Kreisweit, which had just come out at that point. So mm -hmm. that was in 2016. And um, so the, the slide said 2017 because that's the official publication year. And so the math talks you usually cite results by the official publication year, but the results typically tend to be publicly available a little bit earlier. So that's called a preprint version. So that's sort of, I mean, maybe the technicalities don't matter too much right now, but the so-called preprint version was already sort of came was publicly available and was already um, came out about a year earlier in 2016. And so that was one of the first topics I started that sort of reading about in my PhD, um, this sort of capsid problem. And then I haven't worked on the capsid problem itself myself. I've only worked on this sort of mod I mean, this P version here, this one. Um, so which is, has this connection to this addish ginsburg ziff problem. Um, yeah, so this is this great geometry problem. And so I've started working about on that maybe um, a little bit later. And so I've, I've certainly been working on that since 2017 or so, 2016, 2017, something like that. I don't remember exactly. And so I, so this recent paper, so this, uh, this paper here with this result was from earlier this year. So um, the, the preprint came out um, um, a few months ago, um, but I have had earlier papers with uh, weaker bounds um, uh, mm -hmm. this, this problem. So I, I like this problem a lot. It's um, one of my favorite problems. We can tell, uh, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, Polly uh, is asking for recommendations on literature. Uh, maybe, maybe your favorite books uh, that are accessible to young students, uh, Lisa, in that area. Um, okay, so I don't have any recommendations about um, a book about this specific topic with a capset problem. But um, I mean, it's also relatively recent, so I, I don't think anyone has written a textbook about it yet. Um, but I can recommend some sort of general books um, on combinatorics. Mm -hmm. um, so general books intro um, with introductions on combinatorics. So one nice book, um, no, I don't need to remember the name. One nice book is by Matushek and Nezetril. I unfortunately forgot the name of the book, but let me put the names in the, of the authors. Um, so Matushek. So I think there are some accents on the names, but I don't remember where they go exactly. So the, title, the title is something like Introduction to Combinatorics or something like that. If you have a, uh, while facilitating the questions, Michael, if you have time, you can sort of look online, you'll probably find it. Right? I'm on it, Lisa. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. Um, okay, I'll answer the next question in the meantime. Um, are discrete geometry and extreme combinatorics um, closely related or is that an unlike, con unlikely connection? So um, there, there are some relationships. So um, uh, yeah, so it's it's not so unlikely to find it. From, I mean, and my, my result was actually also not the one which found the connection. So this connection had been noticed already much earlier. So our, um, okay, so this result together with Dimitri and also my earlier results on this 
uh, problem were not the ones which sort of made the connection. The connection had already been observed decades ago, ago but our results sort of improved the bounds on the problem. So it was already known that this discrete geometry problem essentially reduces to this extreme problem here with these vectors. And so what we did was to improve the bounds um, on this problem. Ah, yeah, thanks for posting the book. Um, Lisa, uh, Chiri Matushik, uh, he was, uh, um, uh, so I, I guess he passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was a famous mathematician and also professor of computer science uh, at ETH uh, in, in Zurich. I wonder uh, what are the relations of your, your research to computer, or rather what is your relation with computer scientists when you are doing research? Um, yeah, so there are quite a few relationships. So I, I um, reasonably frequently talk to computer scientists. I mean, not every day, but I mean, happens. Um, also happens uh, reasonably often that kind of there are conferences where both extreme combinatorialists and theoretical computer scientists go to. So, so I also know quite a quite. A, I mean, some people in theoretical computer science, and but also, I mean, I. I actually have a paper in a computer science conference also together with some other mathematicians. So, so there are really very close connections between combinatorics and theoretical computer science. And so, so uh, it so often happens that people from one side work on the problems from the other side, or that the problems are just in the overlap and both sides work on it. And or sometimes you take methods from the other side. So it's really a very fruitful connection. So uh, do you also use computer simulations in your work? Um, not really. So, so I guess the theoretical connections are mostly with theoretical computer science. Mm -hmm. Now, using computers in practice for your research, that can be very useful if you're good with computers. Unfortunately, I'm not so great with computers. That is and hard to believe. <laughs> So, um, so uh, I mean, I can do some basic coding, but I've sort of forgotten most of it. And then I was just need to install some software and so on. So by the time that has all happened, you would have lo lost so much time that wasn't really worth to find the result of the simulation. Because I mean, in, in the types of questions I study, the simulation would only give you sort of maybe a hint of what happens because normally you care about what sort of happens as the parameters go to infinity. So the computer can't determine that. It can only sort of, Give you an indication of how it goes for small values, which can be rather misleading sometimes. So it's only of limited use in the area I work in myself. And so I've never really uh, gotten around to brushing up my coding skills. But sometimes I work with collaborators who are better at this, and then they actually do run simulations or test examples. So that's sometimes useful. Well, the answer is 42 anyways, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, eventually. Uh, Lisa, I wonder, what's your favorite mode of doing mathematics? Um, do you um, pen, paper? Um, is it blackboard? Is it by yourself? Is it while talking to other people? Is it under palm tree, uh, trees on the beach? Is it while going for walks, uh, maybe with your kids? What, what is your favorite modus operandi for, uh, for thinking about research? Um, well, I, um, I like talking about uh, research problems with other people and then usually uh, we use blackboards because paper is harder if you with multiple people, at least, uh, at least for me. And when I'm thinking about it alone on a desk, I usually use paper because then you, it's easier to save than blackboard. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think about problems a lot, sort of just, I mean, when you're really on a research problem, it's sort of always in your head. And so I also think about it while I'm sort of on the way to work, I'm, I'm waiting for the train or whatever, or while I'm for a walk with my kids, or while I try to bring them to bed and they do nonsense in the bed and I uh, need to sit next to them and wait until they fall asleep. That's also a great time to think about math. Um, and yeah, so, so basically, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not like I always only think about math, but uh, sort of whenever I have a moment, my thoughts, that circulating, they sometimes get to get to the math problem that I... May I share with you my favorite uh, uh, way of doing mathematics? It's uh, on a swing. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so I highly recommend it. Uh, so find a swing that carries you. They are not all made for, for grown-ups, but I, I have my very best ideas when I'm swinging away. <laughs> Great. 
it's really students it's really important to learn that about yourself <laughs> and don't be shy to try things out and discover it's different for everyone so swings do the trick for me david uh, has a question mm -hmm. well, i'd like to ask why do we need the bounds where we mm, don't know the constants and what's more they work only for large enough ends so i mean we usually work with good smooth functions and mm, mm, so from some moment uh, one function is always bigger than another function so we can choose any function that from some moment is slower than uh, the one we are researching and say that for some constant and from some moment it will be our lower or upper bound so what's the sense um i'm not sure i understand the question correctly but if i understood correctly you were asking well why do we care about this if the bound only works for large n so mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. let's maybe go to the slightly simpler bounds in this s of n before so here, um, yeah, so this only works for sufficiently large ends, or if I understood the question correctly, um, it was asking, well, why do we even care about it if it only works for very large ends? Um, well, I guess it depends on your area, what type of uh, your taste or also your area, what type of questions you're interested in. But in extreme common terms, typically people are interested in sort of the growth behavior for a large n. And so the starting values for n equals one, two, three, four, the first few small n don't really matter to us in extreme recombinatorics. So we want to understand how this behaves as a function and this few small exceptional values at the beginning don't really matter. And that's also the reason why these constant factors um, were unspecified here, because they don't really draw the main behavior so here, for example, the main behavior, so, you should, um, so this result is in the parameter range where P is fixed and N is large. And so the main term here, which drives the behavior of this is this exponential term with it to the N here. And so this is just a constant factor, not depending on N. And so a constant factor is sort of much lower order than this. And so that's why we don't really care what the constant factor is. And so then here again, this D is some unspecified constant. Um, so it's an absolute constant, also not depending on p, um, because well, this p to the 0 0.01 is sort of at least for reasonably large p bigger than this d, and so maybe we don't really care what this constant d is. So, so in in this field, you don't really if, if it's a constant, you don't need, really necessarily need to care what the value is. Like if you can determine it, great, but um, we want to first sort of um, be, uh, find out the main sort of main type of growth behavior and that's not dr driven by this constant factor here for example um, but yeah if we mm, take this oh, the previous bound when uh, mm, it was a constant uh, to the nth power why can why what yeah this one why can we tell that uh, 2.5 will be also a lower bound but for a larger n so, so why, why are you saying, so this bound, is, so you're asking why is this bound 2.218 to the n and not 2.5 to the n? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for example. So um, maybe for a larger n, 2.5 will be okay. Yeah, so that's a great question. I don't know whether 2.5 to the n is okay. So to write proof, then it took him over 10 pages to prove that 2.218 to the n is a lower bound for sufficiently large n. And maybe it is the case that 2.5 to the n will also be a lower bound for sufficiently even larger n, but we don't know. We don't have a proof or disproof of that. And so if you could find out whether 2.5 to the n was a lower bound for large n, that would be very interesting. And you could publish a very good paper on that. So we uh, to understand whether this bound is good, we, we should know why why are we interested in this problem and to know the uh, um, uh, the maybe the interval of our values for example we want uh, our the values of the numbers we deal with are somewhere uh, near 1 billion and that is why we want to get 
a bound that will be okay for one billion. Um, mm. so, so maybe you are interested in when n is a billion, but most people in extremely combinatorics are not interested in when n is a billion, they are interested in when n is large, so n tends to infinity. And a billion would still not be, I mean, you're not interested in any concrete interval for n, you want to understand the behavior as n grows and tends to infinity. Does that make sense? Is mm -hmm. that Okay, I, mean, I, can, I can throw in a question uh, here. So you, um, uh, this paper by Einberg and uh, Wieslid, uh, it appeared in, I believe, Annals of Mathematics. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was another publication uh, in a journal of the American Mathematical Society, as you said, very high marked papers. So would you expect that as people continue to close uh, the gap between uh, upper and lower exponential bounds, do you think all of these papers will go into such highly ranked journals? No, 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 that's so, um, so this paper is about such a big breakthrough because it figured out the actual behavior because mm -hmm. this is sort of a constant strictly less than three to the n. And once we know that, knowing what the actual constant is, is sort of less interesting. Uh -huh. So if you can now improve this 2.756 to 2.6 to the n, um, it would definitely not go to n less of math again, unless you have some really interesting proof technique that uh -huh. sort of, well, okay, definitely I can't say, but I would, I would, I would be surprised, well, on the other hand, a lot of people have tried since then. So, okay, so let me take that back. So, so maybe it's not definitely, but just that this went to the endless does not mean that if you improve it again, it will again go to the endless of math. Mm -hmm. um, sort of, um, but it would require some interesting new ideas to prove upon this bound. So maybe it would still be published in a very, very high journal. So, mm -hmm. um, but so basically what I was trying to say before is that, in some sense, the question is answered because we only need to find out now what the correct number is. And so maybe we don't care that much about the actual number. On the other hand, it would still be nice to close the bounds somehow. Mm -hmm. I, I get it. Thank you, Lisa. Paul has a question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, is there a generalization where you replace FP by some other finite field? Or is this an answer's question to ask? Or even another ring? So you're asking about rather than fp to the n, you want to take another finite field to the n. Yeah, or just or even some special rings uh, or class of rings. Yeah. So sure. so let let me first answer the question for fields. So I don't know. Um. So so this answer is for people who already know what a field is. Everyone else, don't worry about it if it doesn't make sense what I say. So um, if you know more about finite fields, you probably um, you might know that all finite fields have size of prime power. So all finite fields have size something like p to the a for some prime a as well as some prime p. Um. And so now if you take the field of size p to the a, and then you take that field to the n. As a vector space, I mean, the additive structure, since you're only doing addition here, is the same as fp to the a n. And so basically, you oh, don't have okay. any generality because you are not using the multiplication in the field that just addition. Oh, okay. You're not winning any generality by taking finite fields other than prime fields. I see. Um, but now the question for rings, that's um, also interesting. And there's been some work also on rings. I think there's a paper on z modulo 8 to the n and another one. Yeah, um, but, but I forgot by whom exactly. Um, and I, so, so people have studied this for some types of uh, rings, yeah. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions to our speaker? Don't be shy, students. Hmm. So Lisa, what advice? So many, many, many of our students, most of them, they are, um, you know, they participated in high school math competitions. They are very eager to study mathematics now. Uh, what's your advice uh, to them? Uh, what, what, or rather, maybe what advice would you have liked? Uh, would would you like to say to yourself to beginning to the beginning of your undergraduate studies, or you know what did you do that worked really well for you to make that transition? Yeah. So just before I answer that question, should I stop sharing the screen? Um, because I guess maybe now the questions are more general and not related to the talk, or should I still share it in case someone has a question more directly related to the talk? Maybe we can close it for now. Um, okay, yeah, so um, 
yeah, so that's a great question. Um, one mistake I made when I started my undergrad was taking way too many math courses. I think it depends a little bit on where you study, how much flexibility you have to choose and whether there are rules about how many courses, I mean, whether there are upper bounds and how many courses to take. But where I uh, was in Bonn, there was no such upper bounds. And so a lot of people took a lot of courses and that I started definitely with too many. Um, and so also at MIT where I've taught, um, uh, uh, where, I, where I was at the other side teaching courses, I saw that many students took way too many courses. Um, so it might be a more common problem. And so on the one hand, of course, everyone's excited and wants to take as much math and learn as much math as much math as possible. And also sometimes there's some peer pressure because a lot of other people are taking too many courses and you feel pressured that you also have to take a lot. Um, but it's actually misleading. Just by taking more courses, one doesn't learn more because one has less time per course. And so you can't sort of um, digest. I mean, it takes time to digest math. Like um, if you uh, take you know, a university math course, it's not just sufficient to sit in the course and listen to the uh, person teaching the course for an hour or an hour and a half, and then you've learned everything in the whole. Um, you usually have to um, sort of sit down and go through your notes again and digest it more slowly because usually um, it's sort of taught at a pace where it's very hard to follow and to think, think the definitions through and so on. And so you really have to spend time thinking through it again and then, do, and then usually you get exercises which are also supposed to help with digesting and learning the material. And so you should take time to do them carefully rather than just doing it as fast as you can. You should think through them carefully. Um, and so all of that takes time. And so if you take too many courses, you don't have the time needed to digest the material properly. And then as the semester continues, uh, stuff gets harder and harder and then it gets too much. And um, yeah, so then you kind of don't get any sleep anymore or you then maybe have to drop a course or whatever. And so it's better to not, I mean, obviously it's hard to balance and everyone takes too many courses. And so it's hard to withstand the pressure, but certainly one, one mistake I made at the start of my undergrad was taking too many courses. Mm -hmm. um, um. Maybe I, I, I can add a little bit to that. So I was also a postdoc at MIT teaching students and uh, students were running around in, so I, like you, I got my PhD at, at Stanford and Stanford, the student population, they seem very happy. Uh, I mean, of course, sometimes uh, appearance is deceptive. We, we all know about this, but the happy student population. And, uh, uh, and when I uh, came to MIT, uh, uh, so students were very happy at the beginning, but then after several weeks, uh, you know, they, they looked really, really, really tired. And they wore these t-shirts that were very fashionable at MIT. Uh, uh, and it said on them, sleep is for the week. And I think it's really, really awful. So please don't listen to that. So that is poor uh, peer pressure. Make sure that you, with all your excitement about mathematics, with all your commitment, make sure that you are healthy and also you know, to keep one another healthy. It's really, you know, in the long run, you can challenge yourself and your health, uh, you know, for short periods of time. But if you want to be a research mathematician and make a life out of it, it's really, really important that you keep a good relationship with what you're doing and sleep you know, trying to sleep is a, a good part of that. It's, it's also important, you know, to think about things like nutrition. I know it sounds a little bit silly, but uh, uh, so also when I was a postdoc at MIT, you know, I, would, I had a collaboration with a, a, a professor in Germany and just because of the time difference and because he had kids and, you know, when it was 12, when it was noon at MIT, you know, he would have to go home to, to be with his family. Uh, so I, I would get up really early every day, sometimes at three in the morning, four in the morning. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I noticed that uh, when I was getting so up, I was just so, 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 so tired uh, in the afternoon. But not only because I had little sleep, but also because my, uh, I, need, I didn't pay attention to what I was eating. So, uh, you know, then when I learned about um, um, you know, better ways of, of feeding myself, having more bread, for example, dark bread. Uh, it changed my entire life because I, I could work better in the afternoon as well. Uh, so, um, um, you know, learn about these things. It's, uh, it's really important. It makes a big difference. Stay healthy.
Yeah, and it's definitely important to get enough sleep. Like without sleep, everything is harder. Uh, David has another question. Uh, yes, I wondered, like there was this bound where a constant depended on P. And so, as I understand, the, con the constant is not really a constant, but a function of P and not dependent on D that was the other variable. So it didn't depend on N. So, so basically, you, um, the parameter range where this bound is interesting is if P is fixed and N is large. And so you're right, it's not, it's a function oh, okay. of P, but it's a constant in the sense that if you fix P, then it becomes a, a constant, right? And then mm -hmm. N is the variable that goes to infinity. And so in that sense- Okay, because I was wondering if it grows like more rapidly than P to the epsilon, whatever, like it could be a factorial then. The yes, rest it is could go rather, it could, no, 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 it's not because the rest was taken to the nth power. So the CP mm -hmm. could grow rapidly with P. I don't actually remember what that is. But if you fix it, it's okay. But if you fix it, it's fixed. And then you th should, this, this, so as you said, this bound would not be interesting if N is small with respect to P, because then this sort of unspecified constant would eat everything. But yeah. Um, yeah, the bound is sort of for the range where P is fixed and N is large. And then the main term is this exponential with uh, something to the N and this constant factor was not under the exponent, it was in front, so. Yeah, okay, thank you. We have a question from uh, Ruben uh, from Spain. Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much for, for the lecture. I had a question on, um, before you mentioned when N was like strictly smaller than P, you got like nice results for the question or uh, something like that. And I wanted to ask what these results were because I, I think I'm, I saw a problem in the short list that was like related to that with, like that had a solution by the combinatorial null stands or something. And I was wondering if, like what, how the result looks like for small values. Yeah, so let me, you see the screen again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, Thing. So are you referring to this part that I said that for large and yeah. essentially yes. yeah. so um so that's right. So if if um so this these results are about when P is fixed and N is large. If N is small, say N equals two or something like that, then this this is useless, as the previous question already pointed out. Um and then other techniques become more useful, like the combinatorial notion sets that you mentioned. So, so for the, for, let's maybe go to that version of the problem, the, this geometric problem. So this geometric problem has, um, for n equals one, um, has been resolved by Erdős Ginsburg and Zief um, in the 70, 1970s, so something like 50 years ago. Um, and you can also do that with a combinatory notion that's, and for n equals two, and any prime p, the problem has been resolved in something like 2007. Um, and the answer is uh, something like 4p minus 3 is the maximum number of points without these three uh, p points with the centroid being again a left front in z squared. And so these techniques are also um, the combinatorial notion that's type techniques. So I think the paper is written, so it's by Christian Raya, um, the paper is written um, in terms of the Chevalier warning theorem, but you can also phrase it with the combinatorial notion that's. So these types of techniques are useful for small n and large p, and but these types of but this result was for small p and large n. Very cool. Any other questions from the audience? Please, Please can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, my camera doesn't work. <laughs> um, yeah, but still, uh, Elisa, do you have your favorite problem from mathematical competitions? So probably such that all of uh, the participants could try to solve it. Uh, so not too advanced. Uh, we can call it a problem uh, uh, from Lisa Zauerman. Yes. A favorite problem from math competitions, um, but not too hard. Oh, that's... Um... So this is actually important, right? A problem doesn't have to be hard to be valuable. Yes. Or beautiful. Um... Okay, here's one. Um, it's... Uh... Okay, so suppose you have N points in the plane where N is odd. 
And these points should be such that no four of them are on a common circle. So take, think of n random, so more or less random points. So no four of them on a common circle. Um, and now the question is, prove that you can find three of those n points. Ah, yeah, and also let's have no three of the points on a line. So no three on a line and no four on a circle. Can you find three of those n points so that you have, when you draw the circle through these three points, so three points, if they're not on a line, describe a unique circle, so that the circle, the circumcircle of these three points has equally many of the n points inside and outside. So there are n minus three points left besides the three describing the circle. And so we want exactly a half times n minus three inside the circle and a half times n minus three outside the circle. Oh, I'm typing. <laughs> Lisa, we've got a problem. But it's by the way, I didn't invent it. Um, I just, um, I, I forgot where it's from. Um, but it's from some competition somewhere. So if somebody notices uh, the reference, please, please email us. And, um, and if you found a solution that you really, really like, please email it to us as well. And maybe we, we, we may share it with Lisa. Okay, so I think that's actually a great point to uh, call it a lecture, uh, students. Lisa, thank you. This was absolutely fantastic, uh, and uh, we love it very much. Thank you for taking the time and speaking so candidly about us, about your experiences and sharing your research with us. Um, so uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, a special lecture by Yuri Malitsky, uh, he works in between mathematics and computer science, uh, and his lecture will be, uh, is called Continuous Optimi uh, Optimization for Machine Learning. So I look forward to seeing many of you again, and uh, let's uh, find ways to thank Lisa again for her fantastic talk uh, as you are leaving uh, the Zoom room. Bye, you people. And thank you for organizing this. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture.